Hi, my name is Benjamin Jacobs, and I host a show called From Wittenberg to Westphalia, The Wars of the Reformation. It's all about the events leading up to, including, and following the Wars for the Reformation. Basically, I ask why the wars happened, and what impact they had on the people of Europe. One of the biggest challenges I have faced in my show has been answering the question, what is a Europe? Is it something you can touch? Is it a state of mind? Or is it regional chauvinism made real? These are issues confronted on a daily basis by the citizens of Eastern Europe, particularly those of Latvia, and made manifest in the Eastern Border Podcast. As you are well aware, this podcast provides you, the discerning podcast listener, with an insider's look at Latvia, the Soviet Union, and beyond. This show is a valuable insight into the recent history that is still impacting current events, and I hope you will join me in sitting back, opening up a nice bottle of Kesu, and enjoying the show. Greetings, Tavarishi, and welcome to the eastern border. The real winter has now hit us over here, and it's minus 22 Celsius outside. Just the right time to record an episode, I think. And, as much as I'd like to start my show without announcements for once, so many things are happening over here that I simply cannot do so. Firstly, I have been accepted in the Dark Myths podcast collective, where Daryl Cooper's Martyr Maid, Daniele Bellelli's History on Fire, Jordan Harbour's Twilight Histories, and many other podcasts by very talented authors are. It's a humongous honor for us to be in such excellent company. Go check out all of our podcasts at darkmyths.org. And guess what was the first thing that the Dark Myths guys did when they accepted me? They got the show into iTunes, in a single day no less. We're added from a Canadian account, but we're there. So now, you, comrades, can find us there, subscribe to us, and hopefully leave us a comment or a good rating there. And thank you to those who have already done so. Also, a thank you goes out to Royfield Brown and David Pietrusa for answering our question on the excellent 10 American Presidents podcast. That shall come in handy when we finally get to World War II, And, of course, another thank you goes out to Dan Carlin for retweeting us, which has brought a lot of new people here. So, to all of you new people, either from Dan Carlin's retweet or from Dark Myths, welcome to the show! Visit our site at theeasternborder.lv. You can support us there and enter into our campaign where you can get actual Soviet paper rubles and authentic Soviet medals and pins for supporting our show. Very recently, in Latvia, we had a reminder of our Soviet past. There's this hill in Riga, which is now turned into a park, and a memorial to the 1905 revolution, which I'll talk about in some other episode, called Griesenkalns. It represents everything good for the local socialist parties because of the said 1905 revolution, which failed though, but still happened. So, every year, in the 1st of May, in the International Laborers' Day, our socialist-leaning parties, hold a large meeting there. They're always very pro-Russian and stock full of people who were in important positions during the Soviet era. This is, uh, by the way, why uh, our left-wing parties are mostly pro-Russian and why the political spectrum of Latvia is really weird. Now, these people, they're old, but they're still there. So, last year, one of them, Alfred Rubiks, leader of the Latvian Socialist Party, who used to be the mayor of Riga in the late 1980s and was openly opposed to the Baltic state's independence, publicly stated that, quote, it was perfectly okay to deport Latvians and Estonians to Siberia and kill them because they had collaborated with fascists, end quote. He also repeated his earlier statement that Latvia joining the USSR was a completely free and a voluntary thing much like joining the EU, except that the EU didn't have tanks and an army in here when that referendum happened, and they weren't blatantly looting the place and killing our people. But yeah, in Latvia, defending the Soviet atrocities is a crime, much like Holocaust denial. And he's a public figure, talking in a political meeting. Now, this year, on the 7th of January, 
our security police service, much like your FBI or something, declared that they find no criminal conduct in his actions, besides he's really old now anyways. Old people have influence over the young here. This man spoke at a rally full with pro-Russia socialists, who want to believe what he has to say, and think that everything taught in the history books here is a capitalist propaganda. Old men have the power to alter history and ruin it. Now, Brezhnev ruled as the general secretary of the Communist Party for 18 long, boring years. During the stagnation, that is. He died in the 10th of November in 1982 at the age of 75, dying while in the office. Official cause was named as various illnesses, and he had a lot of them, really. Brezhnev had fostered a cult of personality, invaded Afghanistan, and crushed Prague Spring. He had driven the economy of the USSR to the ground. He had also finally given passports to the peasants in Kolhos in 1981. Previously, they were tied to the land, and if they wanted to leave their district of inhabitants, they had to acquire a permission slip from their local KGB office. And he had suppressed other ambitious people from taking over and ousting him from his position during all of these long 18 years. This episode is about those other ambitious people. Those very old ambitious people. First of them is Yuri Andropov. If that name seems familiar to you, then yes, he has been mentioned in the previous episodes, but we'll get to that. His picture can be seen on our website. Yuri Andropov was born in Nagutskaya, Stavropol region, Russian Empire on the 15th of June 1914. He was a son of a railway worker and a watchmaker. He joined the Communist Party when he was 16, as your average teenager rebelling against the world often does, even in the modern world, and became the leading person of his local Communist Party cell in 1938. During World War II, Andropov was a Soviet partisan, a guerrilla fighter in Finland. Between 1946 and 1951, he studied at the University of Petrozavodsk. In 1947, he was elected second secretary of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Karelo Finnish SSR, which was the SSR that was formed from what the Soviets could gobble up from Finland following the Winter War. In 1954, he was sent as the Soviet ambassador to Hungary. Yeah, you can see where this is going. Andropov was the one who convinced a previously reluctant Khrushchev that a military intervention there was necessary during the Hungarian crisis. And, well, you know, Soviet army doing Soviet things happened. In 1957, Yuri Andropov was recalled from Hungary and was appointed in the committee responsible for war coordination among the international communist parties. That is, he directly participated in funding possible communist revolutionaries and terrorists abroad, quite possibly in your country as well. Through this position, he expanded his power base, and became the leader of the KGB in 1967, and a member of the Politburo, the ruling elite of the USSR, in 1973. Now, Andropov was actually quite scarred from the whole Hungarian ordeal. He had been in the embassy at the time, and had seen through the windows how people were stringing up the deeply hated Hungarian secret police officers from lampposts in the street. He was really surprised and scared by how quickly the total by how quickly the totalitarian, all-powerful Hungarian one-party government was being torn apart. And he didn't want this to happen ever again, especially in the USSR. So he always resorted to violence. Prague, Kabul, Warsaw. The only option Andropov ever saw to deal with these crises was using the military to violently suppress any form of resistance. If Andropov had been the general secretary in the late 80s, which could have happened if his health was a bit better. When the things started to go down in the Baltics, I'm sure that we would have seen a much larger rate of deaths than we did 
currently. You see, as the leader of the KGB, Andropov was, was directly responsible for the harshness in which the Prague Spring was treated. He authorized all of the extreme measures that happened there, and created a whole system of suppression of reformers and dissidents in the Eastern Bloc countries. Andropov aimed to achieve, quote, the destruction of dissent in all its forms, and always insisted that, quote, the struggle for human rights was a part of a wide-ranging imperialist plot to undermine the foundation of the Soviet state, end quote. As he couldn't just send people to gulags anymore, he stuffed people in insane asylums by declaring that, as the Soviet system was objectively the best system on the planet, then, obviously, everyone who doesn't support it and wants to change it somehow must be mentally ill. He even created a special psychiatric health network just for this purpose. So, tons of people were declared legally insane and slowly tortured to death in the various insane asylums throughout the USSR. Because after Andropov had unleashed his system, the mentally ill people had become a minority in these institutions. One other very important thing that Andropov did while still being the leader of the KGB, he found and promoted a less known, relatively young and somewhat efficiency-minded member of the Communist Party to be his aide and various other prominent positions. That person was Mikhail Gorbachev, which will obviously become important in later episodes. Now, two days, just two days after Leonid Brezhnev's death, on the 12th November 1982, Andropov was elected General Secretary of the CPSU, the first former head of the KGB to become General Secretary. This marked the passing of power from the military to the KGB the Cheka finally gaining upper hand in the USSR internal power struggle. Which continues until today, because as you know, Putin was also a KGB officer, a colonel to be exact. He had waited for a long time for this to happen, Andropov that is. Brezhnev, the last of the military leaders of the USSR, had kept the power centralized, and just had lived and ruled for so damn long that Andropov was an old man already by the time of Brezhnev's passing. He had always been there, by Brezhnev's side, pretending to be a loyal follower, but in the meantime, as the head of the KGB, using his people. He had gathered a lot of dirty information about the members of the Politburo. He used his people well. He had gathered information on the Politburo's families, relatives and friends, just enough to put anyone who wouldn't vote for Andropov in the greatest insane asylums on the planet. Because nobody was clean. And even if they were clean, they could be made dirty. Quickly. This is the famous KGB we're talking about. They're not concerned with truth or ethics, you know. <laughs> of course, this was represented in the political jokes of the time, because the common folk knew what was going on. For example, Andropov in the party congress addresses the representatives. All right, those who will vote for me, you can now lower your hands and walk away from the wall. And <clears throat> press announcement. Due to Yuri Andropov's election in the position as the general secretary of the CK USSR, the committee was renamed Cheka USSR. That's a reference to Cheka, to those who didn't get it. His policies were somewhat radical. And interesting, to say the least. Firstly, where Brezhnev had basically adopted a live and let live, or more precisely steal and let steal, policy in the internal party affairs, Andropov was about to have none of that. He was very anti-corruption. Failed, but still anti-corruption. Numerous high-level party members were, at best, fired from their posts, demoted, or assigned to some insignificant position in the other side of the Soviet Union, and, in the worst, most radical cases, declared mentally ill, and sent to the previously mentioned insane asylums. You can imagine that this didn't gain any popularity points for Andropov in the party. He also managed to worsen the U USSR-USA relationships, 
while he did announce in 1983 that the USSR would stop its work on all of its space-based weapons, which were huge at the time. Everyone was figuring out how to militarize satellites and the orbit of the Earth. He had also broken off all arms control neg negotiations with the USA by the end of 1983, which must have seemed like an incredibly awesome thing for American people. So, as a publicity stunt, at the same time he broke off the negotiations, he decided to publicly answer to a very peculiar letter which was sent to him. This letter was probably the thing for which Andropov is most known for, besides the fact that he really made the Cold War worse than it already was. The letter was sent by Samantha Smith, a 10-year-old American girl from Maine, and it was published in the newspaper Pravda. The letter went like this, quote, Dear Mr. Andropov, my name is Samantha Smith. I am 10 years old. Congratulations on your new job. I have been worrying about Russia and the United States getting into a nuclear war. Are you going to vote to have a war or, war or not? If you aren't, please tell me how you are going to help to not have a war. This question you do not have to answer, but I would like to know why you want to conquer the world or at least our country. God made the world for us to live together in peace and not to fight. Sincerely, Samantha Smith. End quote. Now, besides the fact that mentioning God in Pravda, even in the context of this letter, which had been written to the USSR's general secretary, is a bit weird, I have to say that the letter is quite intelligent for a 10-year-old girl. And technically, I like how she speaks about Russia and the Soviet Union as being synonymous. I guess that was the attitude from the outside at the time. It was a bit different here, as you already know. But what really struck me is this use of God, and that no one, of course, responded to that part. But it's still nice. Now, Andropov sent her an answer, which arrived on the April of 1983. I will not quote the Andropov's answer at length here, as it is quite long, but here are some interesting highlights. Quote, You are right that you are anxious about whether there will be a nuclear war between our two countries. And you ask, are we doing anything so that war will not break out? Your question is the most important of those that every thinking man can pose. I will reply to, your, to you seriously and honestly. And then, further in the text of the letter, he says, quote, In America, and in our country, there are nuclear weapons terrible weapons that can kill millions of people in an instant. But we do not want them to be ever used. That's precisely why the Soviet Union solemnly declared throughout the entire world that it never, never will it use nuclear weapons first against any country. In general, we propose to discontinue further production of them and to proceed to the abolition of all the stockpiles on Earth. Now, sounds really nice, does it? <laughs> but I have to remind you again that he had cut off all arms control negotiations with the United States of America by the end of that same year. And a bit more. It seems to me that this is a sufficient answer to your second question. Why do you want to wage war against the whole world or at least the United States? We want nothing of the kind. No one in our country... Neither workers, peasants, writers, nor doctors, neither grown-ups nor children, nor members of the government, want either a big or a little war. Yeah, so much for honesty. A popular hochma in the USSR at the time was that, of course, none of those people wanted a war with the USA, with, with the USA except, of course, Tavarish Andropov. The common people were more interested in a war against Andropov himself. I'll sidetrack a bit here, by the way. Did you notice the word I used to describe this joke? Chochma? That was, and still is, a common slang term for any funny situation or a joke in the Soviet Union and modern-day Baltics in Eastern Europe. Well, turns out, and I confirmed this with Jewish people on the internet, namely Sam Huris from the Foreign Policy Club 
and Ben Jacobs, the glorious host of the Wittenberg to Westphalia podcast, which you should definitely check out, that the Hochma means something like wisdom or a wisecrack in Yiddish. I did some research, and seeing that 90% of the Soviet jokes originated in Odessa, it seems logical to assume that Odessan slang spread itself with the jokes. Moreover, it's the Odessan criminal underground slang, and that's where the lawful thief term comes from as well, and some others. I will explore this in the future episodes, I just thought it would be interesting to tell you this here. Anyways, Samantha was invited to the USSR and had a really nice experience here. She, of course, only met specially trained people, such as family members of vetted KGB and GRU officers, like, especially, a girl from Leningrad, who was completely fluent in English, Natasha Kashirina, whose mom was, and this wasn't mentioned in the US sources, Leningrad KGB's chief's wife. Because, obviously. Not that it mattered. Samantha went back home to the US with completely fabricated happy memories about the excellent life in the USSR. Just another victim of the Soviet propaganda, you might, th- you might think. But this... This makes it all the sadder that she died three years later in a plane crash. It is quite sad when 13-year-olds die no matter where they are. That, however, was completely unrelated to the Soviet visit, so we'll not discuss it here. Tavarish Yuri, after all of this mess, decided th- to do the unthinkable and to make sure that every common person in the USSR hated him with fiery passion as well. Not only the party members whom he tried to eradicate or place in insane asylums for being dissidents or just not working efficiently enough. You see, he instituted prohibition. Well, partial prohibition. Alcohol wasn't completely illegal, but it was 90% illegal, so to speak. Or the so-called dry law in the USSR. Okay, technically, it didn't become active in his own time, but he was the instigator of the massive anti-alcohol campaign that followed. So he gets the blame among the Soviet people. Then again, You could look at that as a massive take-that move, because Andropov suddenly died on the 9th of February in 1984 from kidney failure after being the general secretary for just 15 months, from which he had to spend five of them attached to a dialysis machine. Which is why he never met Samantha personally, by the way, as he wasn't able to make public appearances by that time. He had suffered a serious renal failure in the February of 1983, and since then had been permanently moved to a hospital in Moscow. After his death, a four-day period of national mourning was announced, and, although some people actually had seriously mourned even the great murderer's Stalin's death, almost nobody cared about Andropov. Like in another famous joke. Armenian radio gets asked, was there a cult of personality around Andropov? Armenian radio answers, there was a cult, but no personality. Yeah, Armenian radio jokes make a comeback here, I suppose. But there was another old man in Andropov's funeral, who was eyeing his position even then. Konstantin Udinovich Chernyenko. A man who was already terminally ill by the point of Andropov's death, and held the office after him for an even shorter time, just 13 months. And that was no surprise. All of the Politburo was old, ancient. The people called them Starperi, which is short for Starye Perduni, which literally meant old farts. They were all Brezhnev people, who held on to their power jealously, but couldn't do anything to actually gain more power while Brezhnev was still alive. And he was alive for a long time. Which meant that the men got old. And sick. There was a joke about this, again. What has four legs and forty teeth? A crocodile. 
and what has 40 legs and 4 teeth? Politburo. And this one. What are the job requirements for the general secretary? 1. Being able to say three words in a row without errors. 2. Being able to do three steps in a row without aid. And 3. Promising to die in three years since taking the office. They all were old. Except for Gorbachev, who had taken Andropov's position after his death. In the Politburo, that is. But it's not his time yet. No, 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 not yet. But he's there. He's continuing Andropov's ideas. He is the one who will continue his thoughts and who will institute the Andropov's dry law in the Soviet Union completely, who will try to make this campaign work. And who will finally end the Soviet Union. Konstantin Ustinovich Chernenko was born on the 24th of September 1911. His picture is also available on our website. He was born in an extremely four-pan family in Balshoya Ties. His father worked in the gold and copper mine, while his mother took care of the work at their farm, which was later taken away from them and given to the local kolkhoz anyways. Now, he joined the Communist Party in 1929, previously having been in the Communist Youth Organization, and in 1933 was already serving at the propaganda department of the Novosiolovsky District Party Committee. He continued to get promoted until he acquired the position as a director of the Krasnoyarsk House of Party Enlightenment. No, even I have no idea of what does that mean. But it does sound like something that I would like to be a director of. But mostly the House of Party Enlightenment took care of the propaganda and the ideological leanings of the party members. You know, making sure that everyone believes the same thing, that Marx and Lenin are revered, that every school, kindergarten, military, military base, office, everything has their own red corner. Making sure that everyone believes the communism ideology as it was supposed to be believed in. It's something like in a position of a priest in the Catholic party, I presume. Except much more aggressive. And you get killed if you don't know that. During the war, he continued to serve in various propaganda services. I.e., continued to do nothing useful at all. In 1945, he acquired a diploma from a party ideology training school in Moscow. And, in 1953, he finished a correspondence course for school teachers. Let me paraphrase that. He forced the school to give him a diploma, equivalent to a master's degree, because he had threatened them to expose them as a non-partisan organization and not following the party's standards according to Stalin's ideas. The evidence of this is sketchy and non-documented, and I've just heard about this from anecdotal sources, obviously. But, looking at Chernyenko's life in general, and about the facts that I know of about the Soviet Union, this does seem to be believable, at the very least. And, most of the time, when we're talking about things like this, we're dealing with undocumented, poorly documented, and sketchy evidence on the show anyways. As a lot of documents were either lost or purposefully destroyed after the collapse of the USSR. And we work with with what we have. It's just that the USSR and other socialist governments tend to destroy the evidence which could be used against them. As you can see, Chernyenko was literally a completely useless person, doing a pointless work until 1948, when he met Brezhnev. That meeting was instrumental in his life in the way that he really didn't change at all just got assigned to more important positions doing the same useless thing, such as becoming the chief of staff for Brezhnev when Brezhnev became the chairman of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet in the 1960s. I dare to say that Chernyenko was the most useless USSR leader of them all, coming from neither a KGB nor a military background and hated by all. He was a total and a complete bureaucrat. He was the person who monitored various surveillance devices in the high-standing party members' homes and signed tons and tons of party-related documents daily, including decisions about various mid-level party positions and who would take them. He continued to do this 
even after he became the general secretary, and using various aides to help him when he could no longer write himself. Chernyenko had tried to become the general secretary in 1982 when Brezhnev died, but Andropov and his KGB influence prevented this from happening. However, due to him, Chernyenko that is, being in control of the massive mid-level party network, he still held on to a ton of power. And he used that power to be elected in the general secretary just four days after Andropov died. That is, in the 13th of February, 1984. Note that this was in spite of Chernyenko's immense health issues, and the fact that Andropov himself had wanted Gorbachev to take up the position, as he was the youngest and most energetic of all the Politburo members. There is also this theory that Andropov had, at the end of his life, and by end we mean literally last three, maybe four months, understood that some reform, although he fought against it all his life, was necessary in the Soviet Union, seeing that his work literally did nothing to impact the terrible corruption and the rule of bureaucracy which was going on there. But Chernyenko managed to outsmart Gorbachev in this election, and then, then the insanity began. As Chernyenko had started smoking by the age of nine, not 19, just nine, and had been a heavy smoker all throughout his life, by the age of 72, when he was finally elected, Chernyenko could barely move by himself. He had two bodyguards that helped him move at all times. Historian John Lewis Gaddis describes him as, quote, an enfeebled geriatric, so zombie-like as to be beyond assessing intelligence reports alarming or not, end quote. When he describes Chernyenko this way when he succeeded in Dropov in 1984. Konstantin was supposed to read the, eul- the eulogy in Andropov's funeral, but he mumbled it, misspoke words, and everyone present had to try really hard to decipher what he had said. People, of course, made fun of that. Again, making political jokes, like this one. <clears throat> Why does Chernyenko always has three microphones around him in the TV interviews? Well, one to hold on to so that he could stand... They're providing oxygen for him through the second one, and third one is actually a speaker where he gets told what to say. By this point in history, the Soviet government had lost almost all of its legitimacy and influence among the people, even in Russia itself, turning it into a parody of itself. By this point, we can truly start talking about a post-totalitarian government, where even the people who were supposed to enforce its policies... KGB and the average militia forces were no longer even themselves believing what they were doing. Except a few fanatics, of course, which have gained prominence in modern day. Chernyenko really marks the point where Soviet Union had finally jumped the shark. Now, Chernyenko did most of his political work through Gorbachev, who basically came to the Politburo meetings for him most of the time. And his political work was not much of work anyways. He signed a trade agreement with China, but otherwise, mostly everything followed the path Andropov had said before, as the general secretary himself was unable to act most of the time, which basically meant that the Cold War tensions got even worse. The Soviet boycott of the 1984 Olympic Games in Los Angeles hadn't helped the USSR-USA relations either. And, yeah... The previously arranged prohibition programs continued. Chernyenko was hated, but had literally no impact otherwise. And Gorbachev's election upon his death in the 10th of March, 1985, was almost certainly prearranged before that. As it was the quickest election uh, in the Soviet history happening in the very next day after Chernyenko's death. With his death, the era of very old men had ended. All of them had been there on the top, almost since the very beginning. All of them had strived for power. But only Andropov had bothered to ensure that there would be someone to take over the job. Seriously, though, the deaths of three Soviet leaders in such a short period of time, 
when the people had already been accustomed to some stability, were taken with a large dose of sarcasm. By the way, I have provided a YouTube link in my website, where you can see the whole Chernyankov funeral procession in full length, as it was broadcast in the Soviet television, if you wish to do so. It's a memorial show, sort of, but it contains a lot of material from the funeral. It's an hour and a half long, and probably the most interesting thing that we can say about him. Please, go and at least check out the very beginning of the ceremony, even if you won't look at all of it. You see, in all of this mess, of course, there was a popular joke about the funeral and the deaths. 1984. The Moscow TV news show, Time. The host, Kirillov, a famous TV personality in the Soviet Union, in a black suit, addresses the audience. Well... You'll laugh, of course, but our country has just experienced a humongous loss again. Now then, when we have gotten that out of the way, and before we really delve into Gorbachev and the Perestroika, let's talk about one of the greatest tragedies in the history of the Soviet Union. Instituted by Andropov, well, started by Andropov, then enforced by Chernyenko as much as he could, which is not much, and then Gorbachev really took over and he carried and tried to carry this piece of Andropov's legislator, the so-called dry law, which, although formally instituted, like I said, in Gorbachev's era in 1985, still carried the legacy of Andropov because Gorbachev basically just continued to follow, follow Andropov's plans in this area, and some of the things had started to happen in Andropov's time as well, so over here most people call it Andropov's dry law. It went so far, and was so terrible, that Gorbachev himself admitted that the alcohol campaign was a terrible mistake and a disaster in an interview to Komsomolskaya Pravda in May 2015. If, after 30 years, the one thing that you mention in your newspaper interview, and you were the general secretary of the USSR, was that the alcohol campaign was terrible than it truly was. And, although I cannot give an answer to the question that Ben stated in the intro, what is a Europe, I can answer the question, what was a USSR? A conglomerate of crafty people that tried to cheat the country and ran solely on booze. Until it didn't. Now, I'm probably sure I have spoken about alcohol in the Soviet Union before, so excuse me if I repeat myself in this part. But, think about it, the USSR's ruble couldn't buy you anything. It wasn't about what was the local currency or what not, it was about what could you get for rubles. As you could have, like, nothing in the stores, and rubles couldn't buy you anything, not anything valuable, that is, not unless you stood in a long line, alcohol, especially vodka, was used as a local barter currency for anything useful. Because vodka was always useful, because people tended to be depressed and unhappy in general. You gave vodka to everyone whom you wanted to get things done with. You traded vodka for things. And, for the most part, people were just... just drinking to forget themselves, to go to a happier place, I think. And it was a huge problem, too. It ruined a lot of efficiency. And uh, Gorbachev himself, in the interview that I mentioned, stated that, quote, Please understand that the years before this campaign started, there was a humongous alcohol problem in the nation. People were writing even to Brezhnev some terrible letters stating that everywhere everyone is drunk. The children don't even recognize their constantly drinking parents, which have been lost somewhere, but parents don't even don't even remember their kids. The divorce rates were awfully terrible. I have posted this image on Twitter. I think I will post this on my webpage as well. The Soviets actually, during this era, had a campaign aimed at school children, around 8th and 9th grades, which stated that, <clears throat> quote, School children who don't drink have better grades than those who do. If that doesn't say something to you about how common spread the usage of alcohol was in the Soviet Union, then I don't know what will. 
It was everywhere. Everyone was drinking all the time. Uh, imagine if you were working in a kolkhoz and you literally got no pay and you sustained yourself from what you grew in your own home after the after the work in the kolkhoz, what could you do? Not much, except getting drunk, because you could buy vodka with your rubles, and not much else. Well, of course, you spend you, you could spend your money on buying food, and you did when it was in the stores. But there just wasn't that much in the stores anymore. That's why everyone was so surprised when the Moscow Olympics brought some diversity into the mix. I mean, drugs weren't readily available. The Soviet Union really fought against that. But there was vodka. That is why we still have this anecdote in in Russia today. Say no to drugs. Remind them that we still have plenty of vodka remaining. And that's tragical, actually. Because really, due to the fact that you couldn't really save up even, I mean, you could technically buy a car for one, but my parents waited 20 years in line to buy a car. You can you could only buy a car from the government and you had to wait in line because they were just sent to the army or to the to the high up officials and everyone. It was really hard to get a car there. You could be awarded a car by the government and cars weren't the only thing which had these long official waiting lines until you actually could purchase one. Same went for telephone lines. My parents got their telephone line at the same year that they got their car. They had waited for a telephone line to be plugged in and it's an analog telephone line I'm speaking about. They had waited for a telephone line to appear in my home for about 5-6 years. You had to wait for a car even longer. So it doesn't really surprise anyone that everyone was just buying booze and trading it around. Well, over here in Latvia it was mostly beer. And now imagine this. Someone decides that, oh my god, it's a serious trouble here now, because nothing works efficiently. But instead of reforming your government, you decide that it's all because of vodka. You mistake the consequences for the reasons, that is. Because everyone was drinking because of the Soviet government, not the Soviet government formed because of vodka. Vodka prices just increased dramatically skyrocketed even. Uh, It was forbidden to drink in any official parties, any official events, and the people who drank, like at all, were publicly shamed. There were, in every factory, every workplace, there there was this so-called Biedrutiasa, or the court of the comrades. And if you were caught drinking, then they would publicly shame you. They would drag you in front of them, judge you, uh, say bad things about you, and you were supposed to say how sorry you were, you were, and how drinking had ruined your life, which actually was true in some cases, but they just did it for everything. Even if you were drinking a glass of wine in a birthday party, or something like that, they would shame you. Now, of course, people decided that it was hard to bear the Soviet Union even with vodka, and now when they were even left without it, it became even harder. Then again, Soviet people were always crafty. You know, they had to be crafty to get their own food, to get their own spare parts, everything. Nepotism was insanely huge there. So what did they do? They discovered that our aftershaves were entirely natural. There were two of them. Actually, three. Yeah, three. Ogurchik, Trajurodny, and the little lemon, limonchik. Agurchik means the little cucumber. And trajurodny means the triple dosed one. They were basically just spirits with food coloring added for the um, food coloring and some food additives. All natural. Nothing harmful there. So the people just started to buy, buy those en masse and drank those. Now, when I was like about 20, my father at his old place found one of these Trajurotny bottles there. And yeah, I have tried that out. It is disgusting. And you have to mix it with water. Because it's like pure spirits. 
you have to mix it with water and then it turns into this white liquid and the second thing which they did is a massive massive amount of moonshining now moonshining happened before too even in like the free latvia era but this just turned into a global phenomenon and not only moonshine no no, no. the common distilleries were just one part of what was going on everywhere just one of the things my grandfather made his own wine at home and i know a lot of people over here whose parents still make their own wine and beer because that's like common knowledge making your own vodka yeah that's a bit more difficult because it takes a it takes a lot of things to actually make good quality vodka there to distill it and to go through all of the processes and you know previously in all of the all the official corporate parties People were drinking vodka and all kinds of things just openly. But now they they all kind of shifted. For example, you wouldn't drink vodka out of a bottle. You would just pour it into a coffee can. And then pour vodka from your coffee can into little cups. You'd pour vodka into teacups and hide the fact that you're drinking alcohol. Because what if, just what if, the KGB officials arrived? Still, everyone was drinking, it's just that they were now doing that illegally. They were cheating the country once more, getting more angry at the USSR's government. And, of course, the black market price for vodka arose insanely. It got so much more expensive that the people who were actually making their own moonshine became one of the most richest people who could afford everything in the Soviet Union at the time. Now, like I said, the drinking part wasn't completely illegal, but there was a dosage on it. For example, you could buy a liter a liter of vodka on three people once per month, which made interesting cases as two people were waiting outside the places where you could buy liquor, liquor stores, government sanctioned, of course. They were, they were waiting for their third one, so this third one had become some sort of a meme, they were waiting outside these stores so that they could buy alcohol. Because not all of the people had access to moonshining or homebrews. A lot of them did, yes. But, you know, it wasn't always ready. And if you can buy this one bottle a month on three people, then you would occasionally do that. So there was this joke even about the fact that uh, Chernyenko dies and, and goes to hell. And there's Andropov and Brezhnev waiting there for him. And Chernyenko is just asking them, hey guys, what, 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 what are you doing here? And they in unison happily reply, why? <laughs> of course, waiting for the third guy. Because yeah, there were lines of people forming outside of stores so that they could form packs of three and go into the store and buy more booze, legally. Liquor stores were closed during this era. A lot of liquor stores. Humongous queues formed next to the stores which were still open. Sugar just disappeared from the stores. Why? Because sugar is one of the ingredients that you need if you want to make your own booze. Basically, in the interview, Gorbachev states that he shouldn't have activated Andropov's plans and made this campaign against alcoholism. Instead, should have created a long-term strategy to reduce alcoholism. But that failed. Besides, this dry law thing ruined the already collapsing Soviet economy even further. You might say nice things about Gorbachev, about how he allowed some freedom there, but I believe that if he could have kept the USSR together and made the new constitution for it and changed some things, he would have. It's just that due to the fact that he simply couldn't keep the economy going and with the mass dis dissatisfaction with what was going on it was surreal by this time the prohibition of alcohol was definitely one of the reasons why ussr collapsed so it was weird like that and besides all the cafes and clubs were just transformed we had this bar called la cita which meant uh yes the droplet and it was renamed by this era to the Milk Droplet. And they served all sorts of ice cream shakes there then, not booze. Now, do you imagine working in a factory in the Soviet Union from 9 to, from nine to 6 every day? Because 
in our country still, your one-hour lunch break is not counted in the time that you spend at work. And then you, one day, this 1st of June, you just walk to the store to get your beer, and the beer is not sold there. Well, it used to be from in morning to day, but in very limited quantities as the supplies has been had been cut, and most probably only sold to people who could pay about five times the previous amount. I think that you'd be quite sad as well. So, prohibition, which was in general trying to do a good idea, backfired miserably, as the only thing it achieved was making sure people hated the USSR even more, but they still continued to drink a lot. People just couldn't do anything anymore, and they took it as a really, really huge offense and an insult to their freedoms, what limited freedoms they had they had remained. And besides, the tax incomes from the alcohol sales hurt the already starving Soviet economy even more. By the way, interestingly, this prohibition kind of matches together with the war of Afghanistan and the fact that in 1985 the oil prices fell as well. And, of course, distribution of all kinds of stuff, everyday stuff, shoes, clothing, food, just wasn't enough for the Soviet citizens. Cutting off the booze from the Soviet diet was one of the worst things ever <laughs> Andropov had envisioned. Like I said at the beginning, he was an old man, he had a lot of influence, and he ruined a country. And that's about it for today's show. The next episode will come out in around the 20th of January. And we'll start the series on Gorbachev and Perestroika and how the Baltic states gained their independence. And that little book we mentioned back in episode 1 will finally be pulled out from the shelf again. One other thing which I would like to say is that be sure to visit our site and to check out our awesome and new promotional picture drawn by Dion and Nikitenko, which was made for our show and it's just excellent. Feel free to comment and write us emails too. I'm sorry for everything not being at the top quality, but I hope I'm improving. Good luck, see you next time, and до свидания. This podcast is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Visit darkmyths.org for more shows like this one. The darkness awaits. Thank you for listening to The Eastern Border. If you have any comments or specific details you'd like to know, you're welcome to leave it in the comment section on our site, theeasternborder.lv, and we'll rummage even to the western border to find you an answer. Like this podcast? Subscribe to us on iTunes, Stitcher, or on our RSS feed. Happiness is mandatory. Good reviews and donations feed the farmers of our kolkhoz in the great motherland. The Eastern Border salutes you.